Um, so I'm going to talk about bariatric surgery, uh, and it was really hard to try and condense this all into 10 to 15 minutes, you know, surgeons love to talk. Um, so I'm going to look at some of the misconceptions, some of the evidence, and then the reality of bariatric surgery and the referrals to public and private. So this is what I think is the perception of obesity management. We think it's a small problem, and a little hammer is going to deal with the problem. Uh, at the moment, this is the perception of bariatric surgery. Very small nail, and I think we just we take a it's quite sort of drastic response to the uh, to the nail. But this is the reality of the problem. Okay, <laughs> this hammer is not going to deal to that nail. So actually, proportionally, it's the right tool for the job. So bariatric surgery is the right tool for the job. But I sort of go further than that. I don't think bariatric surgery per se is a tool. I actually describe to my patients that it's like a machine, and at the moment, this is a traditional weight loss uh, um, model that I use, and I say it's a machine. At the moment, we do, you, you guys do the lifestyle changes, uh, diets and exercise, and you re recommend that to your patients, and you have a lot of support here from family and friends and from yourselves. You support them through all this, but this is a very inefficient machine, okay? You can lose weight. Everyone can lose weight on diets, but it's not very effective in the long term. Uh, so very inefficient weight. What I say is, this is the surgical weight loss model. We're going to add a couple of more cogs into this machine and make it a very efficient way of losing weight. And I purposely make surgery a very small cog here because that actually is just a small part in this whole machine. But with surgery, when you, when you refer for bariatric surgery, you also get all these other things as well. So it's not, you're not just referring just for the surgery itself. And I think that's a common misconception that you just, we're just going to do the surgery and then leave the patients to themselves. We do have all this other support as well. We have dietitians, we have coaches, we have trainers, we have bariatric clinicians. Some people use clinicians or bariatric physicians uh, and also psychologists as well when required. So this becomes a very efficient way of losing weight. So some of the you know, three misconceptions that I sort of uh, highlight here today. So surgery is a cop-out. Individuals just need to go on a diet and exercise program. Well, we know that obese individuals become resistant to the long-term weight loss by diet and exercise. And that the surgery just changes the rules a little bit, as we've seen in the machine. Another misconception, the chances of dying from bariatric surgery is more than the chance of dying from the obesity itself. Well, it's actually not true. So... You all refer for gallbladder operations, hip joint replacements, and, and uh, hernia repairs. They actually have a higher chance of dying from the operations than they do from bariatric surgery. So that's worldwide literature. Most people who have bariatric surgery regain their weight. We all hear these stories of they've regained their weight. Well, they do. For up to 50% may regain some of their weight, but they never regain all the weight. And that's an, excep it's an exceptionally rare that a person who loses all their weight will regain it all to their, their, their starting weight again. That they, do, they do regain some weight. But you've also got to look at, I always look at, how do you judge success after bariatric surgery? It's not just about the weight. We seem, tend to focus on that. We also got to look at all these other things as well. Success is also measured by improvement, uh, remission, or prevention of comorbidity problems. Also, quality of life. A lot of them come in and say, gosh, I can now fit in that chair. I can now put a seat belt on. I can now bend over and tie my shoelaces. I can go to the toilet better. So all these other quality of life issues. Uh, they live longer, and also there's a reduction in cancer risk. Just a couple of studies, I won't bore you too much with the studies. This is the Swedish Obese Subjects trial back in 1987 to 2001. They got over 4,000 patients, 2,000 in the control arm where they just, just left them to their own devices, what GPs uh, uh, provided with advice with regards to diet and exercise. And then there was another arm of 2,000 people who had operations. And you can tell that everyone in the operation group lost weight. So we lose the weight, and then there is some weight regain, as, as I've described earlier. So, but we can see it out to 20 years, even though the numbers are small, people are still, still have weight loss out to 20 years down the line, even though the numbers are small. And the same study, we looked at diabetes. Those who had diabetes uh, at the beginning, how many went into remission at two years? Certainly a significant difference between the, the operative group in the purple and the control group in the green, and then out to 10 years as well. And if we look at all those that didn't have diabetes at the beginning that, but then developed it, again, in the green, the control group at two years, a lot more developed diabetes compared to surgery group, and the same at 10 years' time. So there is an improvement. So diabetes is a big thing now with diabetes management. The International Diabetes Federation now puts bariatric surgery up the top as part of management rather than as a last resort down the bottom. And cancer incidence, unfortunately for men, it didn't make any difference to their cancer risk, but for females it did because of the estrogen-related cancers. So uh, certainly down the line, it does make a significant difference in, in women. And mortality, 
Okay, so there is a difference uh, in mortality rates. The green bar is the surgery, and the control group is the, uh, uh, is the non-surgical group. So there is a difference in mortality over time. One other one, stampede trial, which is a bit more relevant because we're doing uh, gastric sleeves and gastric bypass. Um, control group, they looked at basically uh, improvement in the HbA1c. And in the control group, not much improvement. In the uh, surgical group, uh, certain uh, statistical improvement. And with weight loss as well, we see a difference in the weight loss. I sort of pulled out this article, I thought this was quite interesting. This is about five years ago, and this was a, a, a study done of 12 GPs down in Wellington. And I don't know if these views still hold true today. GPs feel responsible for the treatment of obesity in their patients. I don't know if you all feel responsible for that. You've got to remember that, that, that obesity is a chronic disease and you shouldn't have the burden of, of managing obesity by yourselves. It should be a shared care thing. It's not just your responsibility. When you have someone who has uh, respiratory, chronic respiratory illnesses or renal failure, you don't try and manage that all by yourself. You refer to specialists. So you've got to, help, you've got to ask for help. Don't feel like it's all your problem. They found a, a, a sense of disempowerment uh, regarding the ability to carry this out. So they felt like obesity is normalized. And I must admit, at, at Middlemore, when I see a patient and I say, God, that patient looks really skinny. Actually, the normal weight, the ones that I'm used to dealing with are BMIs over 30 or 35, 40. So even we normalize it at Middlemore, it becomes the normal. Uh, the, you know, we think there are some psychological issues to weight, uh, to their weight management. Well, that's a real uh, you know, can of worms, that one. Uh, stigma, there's always a stigma associated with obesity. Lack of actually good interventions. Well, we do have one, bariatric surgery. We know that that's proven to be a good intervention now. Uh, and low resource availability. And with regards to the bariatric surgery, it was interesting to hear their thoughts. They had a bit of an ambivalent attitude towards it. Again, I don't know what's happened over the last five years. Have the, has, the, has that changed amongst you guys? Uh, it doesn't address the root cause. It's a drastic intervention. We've talked about the nail and the hammer. Uh, and there's a high level, level of risk and morbidity. And we know now that there isn't. The, the surgery we do now is much different to the surgery we did 20 years ago. It's safer, it's laparoscopic, minimally invasive, we've got good anesthesia, so it's very safe now. So you shouldn't, oh, that hasn't turned out right, but it shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't feel like that it should be GP and bariatric surgeon in isolation. We should actually work together in, in this. So the public and private bariatric surgery, I'll look at sort of public referral. So when you make a referral to us, uh, you actually are with that, uh, with that patient's journey. You should be with that patient in that journey through their surgery, okay? <laughs> so by and by, this is what we do in public as well, the sleeve gastrectomy, if you haven't heard of it. Uh, that's, about, uh, uh, that's what we predominantly offer at Middlemore. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. And since 2013, it's been the most common operation around the world. Uh, for its simplicity, although there are a lot of technical issues. Uh, some people say sleeve and leave, uh, but you know, we, we, we do like to follow patients up. Um, so that's the public referral, and this is based on, the public referrals are based on these criteria back in 1991. So that was when I went to medical school, my first year at medical school, and this was a two-day conference with all experts, and at that time, in 1991, they were doing open surgery, they were doing uh, something called a vertical banded gastroplasty, and they were doing a gastric bypass, which is very different to what we do now. So of course there were high complication rates, high morbidity, high mortality, and that's what these criteria were based on, so they only wanted to do the worst of the patients. Unfortunately, we still quote that today, and that's what the basis of what we do today, using these criteria, which is, which is actually wrong, okay? We need to, 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 to change that criteria. It never included the exclusion criteria, so when you're thinking about referring your patients to bariatric surgery, and each DHB will be different how this process works, and that can be the frustrating thing for you guys. So there are some exclusion criteria, and some of them are relative, and some, some of them uh, are absolute. So if they have a drug and alcohol addiction, do not send them through, okay? If they have a terminal illness, do not send them through, okay? Untreated mental illness. Now, you can treat that. We do see patients who have been treated, and that's fine, they actually do very well. So just because they're untreated at the time, if you go away, get them treated and they're all sorted out, then re-refer them, we'll see them. Other serious medical conditions, so people who have end stage anything, please do not send them through, okay? Or any, anything that just seems sensible to you and you think, well, this doesn't seem right. Smoking is a relative one. Now some surgeons and some DHBs don't mind people who are smoking. Middle more, we want them three months smoke free. So when you first see them and discuss um, you know, weight loss surgery, have we broached that topic? 
also broach the topic of smoking and get them on a, a smoke-free plan because they've got to be smoke-free. We don't want to bounce them back uh, because they're smoking. And then age. Age is an interesting one. We used to have criteria. You can only do people between 20 and 50. We got told off by the Ministry of Health because you can't be ageist. Okay, so we can operate, like, well, the minimum age we will operate on is someone 18, but we have no maximum limit. And the oldest we've operated on is 73, and they did very well. Okay, so we can't be ageist, uh, so we got a bit of a ticking off there. Okay, so we changed it. So, and you've probably seen these in the paper. This is from this year. Uh, you know, bariatric surgery is a postcode lottery, so it depends on where you live. So these people go on about equity and equality of access to this sort of service, and you're not wrong. Okay, and this is the paper it was based on, and these are all the DHBs down the left-hand side. And if you have a look here, population BMI of 40, so these are all potential people who are eligible for surgery, but that doesn't include those who are excluded, of course. So the maximum number, potentially, of all these people could be operated on. These are the actual numbers we're operating on. So this is per thousand BMI. Of, so for Northland, we are only 0.9 uh, per thousand, okay? Translated to that, that means that's 0.09% of that population. So all of these here, we only operate on, in 2013 and 14, we operate on less than 0.5% of those that were potentially eligible for surgery. And then a year later, those figures haven't changed much. You can see the most done at Counties Manukau, we do a lot, uh, because we've got the biggest, uh, the heaviest population, 31,000, compared to every other DHB. But some miss out. And that's just, you know, and that is the postcode lottery. If you live in DH, it counties Manukau, possibly get it. But at the end of the day, if we look at 1.8, that's 0.18% of the total population get the operation, and that's down in 2014 15 to 0.15%. So there's this, we, they developed, the Ministry of Health developed a national prioritization tool, which is a bit of a misnomer, really, because it's not a national prioritization tool at all, it's DHB relevant. So just because if you score a, a score wherever you are in the country uh, with, uh, with a score of say 65, um, that doesn't mean you'll get surgery anywhere. It just depends on your DHB. So it was based on these criteria and it offset it against surgical risk. So where to apply this? And I think the best place to apply it is at the determination of access to the first specialist appointment. So when you refer to us, we put the numbers into this tool we get a number, and depending on your DHB, will determine if you go forward for a specialist appointment. So at Middlemore, arbitrarily, that number might be 45. So anyone who scores above 45 will get a, an appointment. Below, they don't. At another hospital, that threshold might be 65. So, so you might not get that surgery at a different hospital, even though you score the same number. So those are some example patients. So this is a female, 43, BMI 47. No other medical problems, they score a 28. And uh, if we say the threshold, and this was a few years ago, at minimal was 45, return to GP. And then sometimes we get a few letters back from you guys saying why not, and so forth. But this is what the numbers tell us. Again, for a male at the same age, if you're a diabetic, less than four years, good HbA1c, you get a very high score. So diabetics are the ones we're looking for. You get the biggest bang for our buck. Type two diabetic, on medications, less than four years, good control, let's see those people, okay? And there are a lot of those out in the community, okay? So please refer those ones. Those have a high chance. If you've got other medical problems, you score just under the threshold sometimes and return to GP. Public programs, uh, the basics, they will usually have a surgeon and dietitian, nurse specialist, you may have a psychologist. That's not essential to have a psychologist in the program. And so we do set weight loss targets in the public program because it's the only way we can assess motivation. So some patients come back and say, oh, I had to lose eight kilos or 10 kilos, and that's the reason I went to get bariatric surgery anyway. It becomes a vicious circle. Uh, but that's the only way we can assess motivation. And so those are, those are targets that are set in stone. Um, and then everyone has to go on this low calorie diet. You have an operation. It's usually a sleeve. Sometimes you do a bypass as well. And then we have ERAS protocols. This is the important thing for you guys, and I don't have another three hours to talk to you about complications here, but this is where, you know, discharge to GP and you monitor complications for us. Um, and like I said, we will try and monitor them for the first year or two years after surgery, but then we discharge back to it. So we do rely on you guys to look after our patients for us 
and feedback to us and, and tell us if there's any problems. And usually you'll liaise with the nurse specialist and, you, and patients know the nurse specialist very well and they'll say, oh look, I'll just contact Cecilia Westmacott, she's our nurse specialist. Uh, so you need to let us know when things go wrong. In private, it's a little bit different. Ideally, again, if you refer me a patient in private, you'll go through the journey with them. Unfortunately, more than 95% of my referrals are self-referrals, so you guys aren't even in the picture. Okay, so the patient comes through, has their surgery, and you might join them at the bottom end down here. Okay, <laughs> now that's the rule on my gastric bypass, by the way. It looks a bit more complicated than the sleeve. It is, and with, with a com more complicated operation, you get more complications down the line. So unfortunately, sometimes a patient will come through, don't even see the GP, and doesn't have anything to do with you guys. And so you don't know what's going on with your patient. That's bad for us. We tell them, and sometimes they don't even have a GP at all. And, so, and sometimes you'll pick these patients up and go, oh, what's going on here? Or they'll never come back and see me again. So, but that's up to the patient. We give them informed consent. We tell them how important it is to do uh, their follow-up. But it's up to them at the end of the day. So like I said, we use slightly different criteria in private. We actually see everyone over BMI of 30 rather than the 40, because these are more relevant. You might think, well, that just creates more work for us. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's good for us. But these are the uh, American Surg Surgical and Metabolic uh, Bariatric Surgery Society guidelines. So everyone over 30 who's technically obese sh will benefit from surgery. So we ha I'm happy to see anyone with a BMI over 30. Same exclusion criteria as in public. Same process again, although we might have a few more things in the follow-up, and I do follow them up for two years and then discharge to your care. Funding, how much does it cost in private? These are the prices, 20 to, 20, 20 to $25,000, depending on who you go and see. You can self-fund, you can get medical finance from Nova. Insurances will pay, Southern Cross will pay between five and seven and a half thousand dollars towards it, but won't pay at all. Uh, KiwiSaver, you, people are accessing the KiwiSaver, and there's a debate, should they be access, accessing that? Well, I think yes, because if you're gonna die before you get access to it, what's the point of having it, okay? <laughs> so, and there is, there's four ways to access it early, and, the, and you go for the fourth one. Significant financial hardship includes if you're suffering from a serious medical illness. Well, if you're obese, technically that's a serious medical illness. So you can encourage them to use that if you want to. Medical tourism, I just thought I'd just add this slide in. And that's a big thing. Oh, it's cheaper to go overseas. Well, it is, but there are other costs, plus, plus. Actually, just getting there. Flights doesn't include flights. It'll include accommodation, but does not include ongoing access to your surgeon. Okay, so once you come back from Thailand or wherever, you can't get access to that surgeon. And follow-up is essential. Actually, follow-up is critical for the, for the wellness and to get the best results. And for monitoring of complications as well, because they're lifelong. So that doesn't include all that when they say, well, that's very attractive price, that's only $15,000. But you probably have to pay another $10,000 or more uh, afterwards. So summary, management of obesity is everyone's problem. Don't feel like it's your burden to bear. And the traditional methods are just not effective anymore. I think surgery is, is the only proven method of effective and sustained weight loss. And it is safe now. Bariatric surgery is safe now compared to 20, 30 years ago. Access is limited, unfortunately, there's resource constraints, but you can get it in the private sector. And like I said, it depends on what you value in life. You know, do you value uh, your cup of coffee every day, which I found out was like $5. I don't drink coffee, but it's $5 something for a cup. Oh, it's a rip off. Uh, but you, could, uh, you can save. I mean, you can save. There are ways. It just depends on what the patient values. And a final word, just to reiterate actually what's been said, if you have any concerns, please call us. No matter where you are in the country, actually, you can actually call the registrars at Middlemore, Auckland, or wider matter, because uh, they don't know where you're from, and ask for advice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>